Thank you very much, everyone. What a glorious opportunity this is. It's a great honor for me to be asked to participate in the observation of Abraham Lincoln's 200th birthday here at this iconic hotel where Lincoln himself stayed both in 1847 when he was a freshman congressman and again from February to March of 1861 as he prepared to become the 16th president. It's not the same building, of course, but it's on the same spot and retains the same social and political pedigree as the original. I might note as an historian of the naval side of the war that Gideon Wells, Lincoln's voluble and opinionated Secretary of the Navy, also stayed here, ate many of his meals here. So did David Glasgow Farragut and David Dixon Porter whenever they came to Washington. It's a great honor, too, to share this event with Senator George McGovern. I will tell one quick story at the Senator's expense, or perhaps my own. In 1972, I was a very junior U.S. Naval officer serving as the flag lieutenant for the president of the Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island, Vice Admiral Benedict J. Sims. You'll recognize the last name. As befitted my lowly rank of ensign, my role was mostly to answer the phone, respond to letters, write a few short articles and speeches for him. That year, he and his aide, who was a lieutenant commander and therefore infinitely superior to me, took a trip to Indonesia on behalf of the U.S. government. After they left, only the chief yeoman and I were left behind in the office to mind the store. And during the ensuing week, I took advantage of this opportunity to park my car in the president's parking space, <laughs> which was directly in front of the canopied entrance to the Naval War College. Little did I appreciate at the time what an impact that would have. It was the talk of the college for days that the car parked in the president's parking space bore a bumper sticker that read, McGovern for President. <laughs> Lincoln, I think, might have allowed himself a hearty chuckle at that story, though Lincoln laughed hardest at the stories he told himself. He always laughed at his own jokes and encouraged others to join in and often helped diffuse a tense situation. Those who lacked a sense of humor, who had their own notions of what constituted presidential dignity, sometimes protested that it was unfitting for a president to be so indecorous. And to be sure, some of Lincoln's jokes were genuinely indecorous. But if so, we can forgive him for the sake of the burden he bore. It is ironic at several levels that Lincoln should have spent his entire administration from virtually its first day until its last, which was also his last on earth, as a war president. Ironic because he was a peaceful man who first made a name for himself during his first and only term as a congressman from Illinois by protesting President Polk's declaration of war against Mexico. Lincoln declared on several occasions that the spot on which blood had been shed in 1846 was not indisputably American soil, that Polk had sent an armed patrol into that territory quite deliberately in order to provoke a war, a war not only of imperialism, but a war for the expansion and aggrandizement of slavery. Lincoln became famous, or perhaps notorious, for these spot resolutions, and he never did surrender his view that the war with Mexico had been a great national mistake. Nor did he find any glory in war. In one of those speeches in which he attempted to call President Polk to account for starting a war of choice, he mocked his own military experience as an elected militia captain during the Black Hawk War. Did you know, he called out in his reedy Kentucky twang, that I am a military hero. Yes, sir, in the days of the Black Hawk War, I fought, bled, and came away. I had a good many bloody struggles with the mosquitoes. <laughs> and although I never fainted from loss of blood, I can truly say I was often very hungry. 
And yet this peaceful man presided over the greatest and most terrible war in our history. In Article 2, Section 2 of the Constitution, the first power granted to the President is the duty to act as Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy. The Constitution is silent, however, on the question of exactly how the President was to exercise that power. George Washington took it quite literally during the Whiskey Rebellion in 1791, donning a uniform and riding at the head of his troops into western New York. Andrew Jackson at least considered putting on his old uniform and riding down to South Carolina during the nullification crisis of 1832. Of course, both of these men had been generals before their election to the presidency, and for them, thinking of war in terms of hands-on command was second nature. For President Lincoln, the notion of appearing in public in a military uniform probably brought a wry smile to his craggy face, for he knew that he did not cut a very heroic figure as a military man. Though he was a competent horseman, his angular frame often looked awkward on horseback when he visited the soldiers in their camps, and his trouser legs sometimes rode up over his socks to reveal long, pale, presidential shins. Some of the generals thought this undignified, but the soldiers loved him for it. Lincoln simply rejected the notion of the dashing military commander as head of state. The Napoleonic model held no allure for him. What he wanted was for some other, more competent individual to run the war for him. The same was true in the naval war. Lincoln would have been perfectly happy to leave the war at sea entirely to the experts, to Gideon Wells, his loyal but often cranky and always opinionated Secretary of the Navy, to Gustavus Vassa Fox, the nation's first Assistant Secretary of the Navy, for whom Lincoln created the post, and to the several men who emerged as the nation's first admirals. But as in the land war, Lincoln soon found that he was more involved either than he wanted to be or expected to be in the management of the war. The very fact that the secretaries of war and navy both sat as co-equals in the cabinet meant that there was no individual in the entire nation other than Lincoln himself who could command both the army and the navy at the same time, given the importance of army-navy cooperation in coastal and riverine operations that forced Lincoln to become, in effect, the joint commander of Union combined operations. Lincoln also became involved in the hiring and occasionally the firing of the Navy's senior officers, the admirals. The American Civil War was the first conflict in our history in which senior naval officers bore the rank of admiral. Before 1862, the highest rank available was that of captain with some senior captains bearing the complimentary title of Commodore, but no admirals. And just as Lincoln had to suffer through generals like George McClellan and Joe Hooker, he had to deal with admirals like Samuel Francis DuPont and David Dixon Porter. If he didn't have to deal with political admirals in the same way he did political generals, he did have to deal with admirals who had substantial political backing and many with substantial political baggage. It was an ironic and unkind fate that placed this peaceful man at the center of our nation's bloodiest war, and we are lucky that it did. Throughout that war, Lincoln exhibited several personality traits that defined his leadership and allowed him to become the great president that we honor today. The most obvious of these was a kind of serenity fueled by patience and a habit of thoughtfulness. In our own impatient and assertive era, we tend to assume that strong presidents should be proactive, controlling a situation rather than responding to it after it has happened. But for his part, Lincoln was almost never proactive. From Fort Sumter to Appomattox, he was compelled to react to events as they occurred. 